Hello, and welcome to Politics for the People. I'm your host, Michael Striano. Thanks for listening and joining in the conversation. You can find links to our Patreon and Instagram in the show notes and sign up for our weekly newsletter. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts to help others find the show. Okay, let's get to it. Our topic this week, the Supreme Court. This week will be part one, so make sure you're subscribed and check back next week for part two. Obviously, the topic has been on everyone's mind since the passing of Associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We'll talk about the Supreme Court's jobs, especially protecting our constitutional rights, like privacy and free speech. But how much do we know about the court itself? What is it? What does it do? And why do we have it? First, let's start with the definition. The Supreme Court interprets our laws and determines their validity. Have you ever read a law? A lot of Congress people are lawyers, so our laws are often confusing and ambiguous, leaving room for interpretation and different meanings. There have also been laws passed that infringe on our rights as Americans, which violates the Constitution. The Supreme Court protects us from those laws and is the top tier of one of our three branches of government, the judiciary. To make an analogy, You could say the Supreme Court is, to the rest of the judicial system, what the presidency is to the executive branch. They have final say and lead their respective branches in a lot of ways, but the federal judicial system is pretty large, and even though the Supreme Court is a very important part of that system, just know they're not the only ones making decisions. They'll often defer to lower courts or even rule that they have no jurisdiction over a case, so it's not their job to say one way or the other. So that covers this question a bit, but what is the Supreme Court? The court was established by the Constitution, but that's about as far as the document went. The actual assembly and makeup of the court was left to Congress, which has altered the court many times throughout its history. As the country grew, the court system was expanded to cover the new states and territories, so that today, the federal judiciary consists of over 100 courts. The Supreme Court itself has changed over the years, with seats added or removed eight times, ranging in size from five to ten seats. One of the Court's most important functions within our government is as a balance of power. Leading one of the three branches of our government, the Supreme Court is meant to function in unison with Congress and the President to best serve and protect the people of the United States. Unfortunately, the system doesn't always work but we'll get more into that later. That's all more technical information about the court itself, but what does it do? As I said earlier, they interpret the laws, and traditionally, the court has been careful to stay within their purview. Even at their most progressive, it's never been an institution that pushes the country forward. In fact, when they've been pressed to do so, they appropriately pass their responsibility on to Congress, saying, pass a law. Perhaps the Supreme Court's most significant power is in declaring the constitutionality of laws. Known as judicial review, the authority was not granted by Congress or the Constitution, but is based on the 1803 decision Marbury v. Madison. The specifics of the case can get a bit confusing, but here's what you should know. Chief Justice Marshall ruled that in any case involving the Constitution, the Supreme Court had original jurisdiction, meaning the case is heard first by that court. Since the Supreme Court is the highest court, their ruling is final. Marshall also stated that the Constitution took precedence over an act of Congress. Basically, the Supreme Court looks at a law and says, does this law violate any rights protected by the Constitution? If the answer to that question is yes, The law is eliminated. The court has shown several times throughout history they will reevaluate their interpretation of laws, but only when presented sufficient, irrefutable evidence proving the plaintiff's argument. For example, let's look at the famous cases known as Plessy v. Ferguson and Brown v. Board of Education. First, let's look at Plessy. 
The case was actually a setup, testing whether or not a recent Louisiana law was constitutional. A group of mixed-race professionals assembled and planned a real-life test situation where a mixed-race man, named Homer Plessy, sat in a whites-only train car. When asked to move to the non-white car, he refused and was arrested for violation of the law. After losing the subsequent court case, as they assumed they would, the group pushed forward, and eventually the case was heard by the Supreme Court. After hearing the case, the court ruled in 1896 almost unanimously that the law was constitutional provided the separate areas were equal. Separate but equal would become the rallying cry of racist and pro-white organizations for more than a half century. The lone dissenter, Justice Harlan, argued that any such infringement of personal liberty presupposed the inferiority of black Americans, placing the label of servitude on them and was therefore tantamount to slavery. Now, let's move on to Brown. Similar to Plessy's testing of the law, the NAACP filed multiple suits in different states on behalf of black elementary and high school students in an effort to overrule the idea of separate but equal. The cases made their way through the court system and arrived at the Supreme Court, arguing that non-white schools were statistically inferior to their white counterparts in nearly every way, so clearly separate but equal did not exist. The challenge achieved a unanimous ruling in favor of the plaintiffs in 1954, 58 years after Plessy. Separate but equal had been torn down, but the limits of the court were clearly shown in the country's response. In 1955, the court ordered states to integrate schools with all deliberate speed, but the majority of Southern public schools remained segregated through the 1960s. They say hindsight is 2020, and Plessy is clearly a ruling the Supreme Court would love to have removed from their past. But the unanimous reversal in Brown is essential to the proper functioning of our government. If a president wants to change their position, they can do so easily. Congress can pass another law or even an amendment to the Constitution. As the opinions and the needs of the people change, the court's firm establishment of overturning precedent is vital to retaining the trust of the people. It's the court admitting they were wrong and trying to make it right. So why do we have the Supreme Court? We all learn about our government system of checks and balances when we're in school, and this goes right back to that idea. For a quick, simplified review, our government is divided into three branches, legislative, executive, and judicial. The legislative branch, Congress, writes the laws. The executive branch, the president, enforces the laws, and the judicial branch, the Supreme Court, interprets the laws. When a case is brought before the court, the question being asked is generally more theoretical. Were this person's rights infringed, or is this law just and constitutional? For example, let's look at the case Miranda v. Arizona from 1966. It's a combination of four cases in which suspects were subjected to police interrogation and confessed without being informed of their Fifth Amendment rights protecting them from self-incrimination. Basically, if someone accuses you of a crime, it's up to them to prove your guilt, and you can't be used as a witness against yourself. The court found the police had violated the suspect's rights, so if you've ever heard of Miranda rights or reading someone their rights, this is why. The court ruled that to ensure suspects were informed of their Fifth Amendment rights, the law enforcement official making the arrest must list them out. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you. If you've ever watched a cop show, this sounds probably familiar. (laughs) That's Miranda. In this case, the question wasn't did they commit a crime, but were the suspect's rights infringed upon? We're going to hit pause here, but check back next week for part two of the episode. We'll take a look at how justices are appointed to the Supreme Court 
and tackle the most important question of all. How does this affect our everyday lives? Thanks for listening, and a special thanks to our patrons on Patreon for your help in making this happen, and all those who have left us a review. Be sure to check out the show notes, where you can sign up for our weekly newsletter, and follow us on Instagram, at Politics for the People Podcast. Want to help shape the conversation, have a say in episode topics, and get exclusive content, including early access to episodes and live conversations with me? Check the show notes, head on over to our Patreon page, and subscribe for as little as $3. We'll see you Wednesday with our newsletter and Friday with a brand new episode. Take care.